Thank you in advance for spending your lunch break the next hour with me talking about some of the hot topics in workplace health, disability management, and productivity. Before I get started, um, I just want to acknowledge where I'm joining from and the land that I have the privilege of working, living, playing on, um, and that I join you today uh, from modern London, Ontario, but I am joining from land that has historically and continually been held in respect and love through the care and stewardship of Indigenous nations. So before I even get into our presentation today, I need to acknowledge the surrounding territories of the Muncie Delaware Nation, the Chippewa of the Thames First Nation, and the Oneida Nation of the Thames. I also acknowledge the current urban Indigenous population of London, Ontario. I feel blessed and honored to be an Indigenous woman and to share in the respect for this land. And I'm learning more about what being an Indigenous woman means to me and what being an Indigenous woman who also has urban heritage or um, European heritage means. Um, but I just encourage you as well, wherever you're joining from, whether that be within Canada or across the world, that you also take a moment um, in your days to acknowledge the land that you are able to live, work, play, um, and join from today. So it's with respect and gratitude that I begin today's presentation. And the session that we are focusing on today, the information that I'd like to share, is looking back at 2022. What did we see in our workplaces? What had big, big effects on us? And what is going to continue to impact us um, in 2023 and beyond? What is next for our workplaces? My name's Nicolette Gowan, and thank you for joining me. I will be going through this information relatively quickly today. Um, so please, I ask that if you have any questions as I'm going through the information, that you just pop that into the chat box and I will do my best to leave time for Q&A at the very end of the presentation today. I do ask that you keep yourselves on mute just because one, we are recording this session and two, it just allows everyone to have the best experience possible. Now, again, today we're reviewing hot topics. I'm not covering everything about workplace health, disability management, and productivity, um, but we do have so many webinars, toolkits, workshops, and training sessions on all of these topics and more. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at our website to learn more about those or contact us. Um, and also learn more about our membership. So we've been running our membership for a couple of years now with great success. And we are opening that membership up again on March 1st, 2023. So get in in March 2023 before we close the doors again for 25% off for the entire month of March if you join our membership. I'll talk more about that at the end today and what's involved in that and the great benefits of that membership. If you want to learn more about us, like I said, contact us or visit our website. We do have so many online workshops and training. We've got some great things planned for you this year. Um, anything from accommodation, mental health, psychological health and safety. Uh, we've got ergonomics, cognitive demands analysis. Again, visit our website to learn more about that. So if you join us every year for our annual review, you might notice that I look a little bit different. <laughs> I am not Nancy Gowan. Um, so I am Nicolette Gowan. And for those of you who don't know me, who maybe haven't been following our story over the past few years, I am the current owner and CEO of Gowan Consulting. Um, so Nancy Gowan, the founder of Gowan Consulting, um, who founded this company in 1999. She is still with our organization, but I guess she plans to retire one day um, and has passed those reins along to me. So you'll see my face more often, you'll hear my name more often, um, and it's a pleasure to be able to introduce myself today uh, to those of you who don't know me. I am an occupational therapist and a clinical lead at, at Gowan Consulting, um, as well as current owner and CEO. I'm looking forward to um, partnering with any of your organizations on your health and disability management. About Gowan Consulting, we do have 24 years in private business. So as mentioned, the company was founded in 1999. We provide services all across Canada, and we're an organization of occupational therapists that focus on functional ability and work. We provide services that range from ergonomics, accommodation, 
stay at work, return to work. We provide mental health support and psychotherapy to employees, um, training, policy development and consultation, as well as workshops. We really help you make the complex simple. So your workplace disability and health challenges, uh, we help to make that simple for you so that you can support your employees and that we work together to create your healthy business and support your healthy business. Because at Gowan, we believe that the most productive, innovative, and successful businesses are the ones that truly care and support all of their employees to be healthy, safe, and included in the workplace. Let's look at 2022. So over the past few years, what we've seen is that the amount of absences for full-time employees has increased steadily over the past few years with 2022 being 12.2 absences. Um, that's up from 2021 as well as 2020. That is a mix of sickness-related absences and personal absences. Um, and now there may be a few reasons for that, but looking at, um, we'll talk a bit later about some of the changes that have been implemented with e uh, employment insurance entitlement, as well as sickness leave for federal employees. And also this year, I think in organizations really focused on looking at flexibility and offering paid time off because employees have been feeling burnt out and have been asking for it. So that might all contribute to the increase in absences that we've seen over this 2020 year. Now, COVID. Are we done with COVID? What does that even mean? What we do know is that COVID has had an impact and will continue to have an impact on the way that we work and the new ways of working. Now, there was an article that was written by Stephen Maybe, um, and it was really focused on law firms and the impact on lawyers. But I saw a lot of similarities that could really apply to all industries and the impact of COVID on all industries. What he talked about was a few of the impacts of this pandemic and what we will continue to see moving forward into this year. We saw societal withdrawal. So not only because employees were required to isolate and work from home and restrictions were placed on us over the past few years, but even as those restrictions are lifting and we're moving back into the workplaces and we're allowed to go out to restaurants and mingle with our friends and family, we see a decreased sociability across individuals where people either lack the desire to be social, or they lack the skills because they've had the lack of practice of being social over the past few years. So this will really start to impact your plans for returning to the office and people's feelings about that and how they return to the office and continue to be social in face-to-face -face interactions that we haven't been exposed to as much over the past two years. But considering that as you create your return to, to office plans. He commented on this scattered uncertainty that we're all experiencing right now. Now, we know in 2020, we did experience a lot of uncertainty about what the future would look like. We didn't know what to expect or how things would play out. But at that time, the uncertainty was focused because we knew we had to focus on health and safety. How do we keep our employees safe? How do we pivot? How do we do things virtually? So things were uncertain, but we knew where to focus. And now, especially in the HR world, there's still a lot of uncertainty, but it's scattered. There are so many things that we need to focus on and think about that it may be hard to have that focus right now. So what do we think about? We need to think about hybrid and remote working. We need to think about workplace wellness. What are our employee benefits? We continually need to think of employee mental health and physical health. How do we retain our workers? What is the impact on our aging workforce and also delayed retirements due to inflation? So there's a lot of things from an HR related perspective that we can be focusing on because of this continued uncertainty that we see. Over the past couple of years, we've also seen burnout globally, but we've seen that at a high proportion in our management and leadership and executive teams. Now this may be because of the pressures of the pandemic, keeping team cohesion, focusing on team performance and productivity, and managing virtual teams. But what we've seen is there is that burnout. And with leaders experiencing burnout, that is trickling down to teams. So not only are we getting leaders and managers and executives that are feeling burnt out, that are either leaving the workforce or wanting to leave their workplace, or that's trickling down to the rest of the employees. And that, that attitude or that outlook 
um, is also being seen by teams. We also see organizations um, managing unsustainable financial results with all of the financial changes and turbulence over the past couple of years, and then thinking about the expectations of returning back to in-person and what comes with that, the costs that come with that in terms of travel and workplace spaces and accommodations. And we see fundamental structural change. It is no surprise to anyone on here today that we work in a new way now. Work looks different than it did a few years ago. We are mostly, um, in most industries, we're adopting a hybrid working arrangement where people can work sometimes from home and people can work from the office as well. We're redefining what it means um, of how we do our work and where we do our work. So we'll start or we'll continue to see that be a change in our workplaces. When we look at mental health risk, again, I'm sure it comes at no surprise to anyone on this call today that the mental health risk and the mental health scores of employees has changed since the beginning of the pandemic. And as we went through isolation and we went through restrictions and health anxiety and grieving, there was an increase in anxiety and depression and isolation. However, we haven't really seen that decline. We haven't seen that return back to pre-pandemic levels, and I don't expect that it will. The recent mental health index that has been ongoing over the course of pandemic released by LifeWorks um, in December 2022 showed that the mental health risk is staying steady at a 32% for high risk of mental health conditions. In 2017 to 2019, that was only at 14%. So I'm not expecting that this number decreases because what we also see is that em employees and individuals across Canada are continuing to experience isolation and report isolation. And those that report feeling isolated or feeling disconnected have a mental health score that is four points lower than the general population. We also see the association with employees and individuals who report feeling anxiety, that the mental health score for those who experience anxiety is seven points lower than the national average. In 2022, 22% of respondents on the Benefits Canada Healthcare Survey reported being diagnosed with depression, anxiety, or a mental health condition. That is double high blood pressure, cholesterol, arthritis. So we know that we are in an echo pandemic. We know that the mental health of employees is continuing to decline and that that really needs to be a focus for our workplaces. When asked, 43% of employees said that they're often or always exhausted after a workday. And 78% say that stress negatively impacts their work performance. So if that's not a call, for a focus on mental health and psychological health and safety, I don't know what is. We also, as mentioned, are seeing this increase in hybrid workplaces. So over 2022, as restrictions lifted and changed, we started to see people returning to the office in a part-time capacity. Um, so the proportion of workers that reported being in a hybrid workplace um, from a Statistics Canada study um, increased for all industries over the course of January 2022 to October 2022. It does differ based on the industry, but we do see uh, workplaces bringing employees back, trying to get that collaboration and that in-person um, social connection that we used to have when we worked from the office. But employers also realizing that, in, that work doesn't have to be fully done from the office. So redefining what it means to work and where we have to work. When we think about our post-pandemic return to work practices, there are some things to consider if you're developing a return to work plan or if you have employees coming back to the office. You will likely receive some resistance to that. Not everyone handles change in the same way. Some people will be energized by it. Some people will be so excited to come back into the office. And then others are going to put up resistance to that. Some employees may have 
concerns about health and safety related to COVID. And those that have those concerns are able to follow that re work refusal process in the occupational health and safety legislation if it's a legitimate concern for health and safety. But we also need to consider employees with disabilities. There's employees that have disabilities that are better accommodated while working for home, from home. And some employees that may request to continue working from home as you open up that return to office plan. Now, as an employer, you know you have a legal duty to accommodate to the point of undue hardship, but it's important to determine if it's a medical accommodation and a need to work from home. As an employer, you do not have to accommodate for an employee preference to continue to work from home. So making sure that your review and your accommodation processes of how that information gets reviewed and how those decisions are made are very um, consistent. As we look at this increase in hybrid work, there are some things that we do need to consider about employee health and safety. We need to consider the home workstation. How is that home workstation defined and how do we make sure that employees are trained and educated on the potential risks for safety within a home workstation? Now that could be ergonomic risks, um, and other health and safety risks. So looking at what are your processes for hybrid working and your health and safety checklist to make sure that employees are set up safe and healthy at home. Providing your employees with ergonomic education about how to properly set up a workstation and what equipment to use to properly set themselves up to avoid repetitive strain injuries. We also need to continue to think about mental health. What impact does remote work have and continue to have on individuals working solely from home? We'll continue to see isolation. How are we keeping employees connected and social with their coworkers? How do we manage, address, and provide support for employees with anxiety or mental health concern? And as mentioned, we may have that reduced ability or reduced desire to be social. So how are we going to manage that and provide support to employees who may need support for reintegrating back into the workplace? As we move employees back into the workplace, whether that be part-time or full-time, we need to navigate a change in the way that we do things, in our routine, in a, in, in a um, commute. How do we add that back into what we're used to doing? Because we're creatures of habit as humans. So what is your change management process when you think about bringing employees back into the workplace? And if you do have employees working from home, what are the boundaries that they set between home and work? We did see that employees had a harder time setting those boundaries and finding that work-life balance, sometimes working longer hours. We have also seen that employees enjoy more flexibility when they work in a hybrid capacity. And it really all stems from of leadership and what tone are you setting about working? In 2022, we also saw the policy, uh, the Working for Workers Act, which required employers to have a policy that outlines the requirement for employees to disconnect from work. So really being clear with your employees what their rights are for disconnecting from work and outlining that in a policy. And also as a leader, setting that example to your organization that you do have boundaries with work and home, especially in a hybrid working capacity. In 2022, we saw changes to employment insurance and entitlement for sickness. So on December 18th, 2022, the EI sickness benefits were extended permanently to 26 weeks. Now this has an impact on your employees. Those with chronic conditions, they are able to kind of get more of that support. However, what we know is that the percentage of chance that an employee returns to work after six months is 50%. So how as an organization are you making sure that your disability management program supports, keeps employees connected to the workplace and helps employees to return to the workplace in a timely manner? And further to that, or even more importantly, what are your options and your accommodations for helping employees to stay at the workplace? Because these are going to be more important than ever as we start to see this shift in employment insurance. We also saw that um, those who are federally regulated had an increase in days of paid medical leave throughout 
the um, last year on December 1st, that came into effect, coming to a maximum of 10 paid medical days. Another topic that continues to be prevalent, and I would say even increases in prevalence, is the, the topic of long COVID. So we have seen with the Canadian Health Survey that Canadians that report COVID-19 symptoms after three months of a positive or suspected test is 14.8% of those that tested positive. Of that 14.8%, 47.3% reported symptoms over one year later. This condition of long COVID is a very individualized condition that impacts each individual differently. However, what we saw is that 21.3% reported that their symptoms are often or always limited their daily activity, and you better believe that includes work. The most common symptoms experienced by individuals who report long COVID are fatigue, tiredness, and loss of energy, coughing, shortness of breath, or difficulty breathing, difficulty thinking or problem solving, and general weakness. So by taking a look at that list, you can see how that would start to impact employees' function at work, if it hasn't already. Whether it's an employee off work, being creative about supporting a return to work, and really thinking about creativity when we're thinking about accommodations for individuals with long COVID. We also saw in 2022 and will continue to see in 2023 that there has been a healthcare shortage. This is no surprise. We are seeing this all across Canada and globally that the sick are getting sicker. So long wait times are continuing for medical appointments and proper treatments. And in the Benefits Canada Healthcare Survey, it said that it's more likely in those with high stress, poor mental health, and poor overall health, as well as those aged 18 to 34. So it's really important that we focus on what is our accommodation process for individuals? How do we obtain medical information and make sure that our employees are getting the appropriate care to recover? Because it really is those with chronic conditions that are um, experiencing these delays in healthcare and recovery. This may impact longer recovery periods and prolonged disability. So this year we need to focus on what are temporary work accommodations maybe that we can provide to employees to keep those employees at work while they wait for their healthcare. In 2023, we need to focus on disability inclusion. There has been so much work and efforts put into discussing, creating awareness, creating policies and programs on EDI and DEI programs. However, a lot of those programs have kind of left disability to the side. In the recent LifeWorks Works Mental Health Index that was released in November 2022, it stated that individuals with disabilities are twice as likely to say that their organization does not value diversity. They are more likely to feel that they cannot be themselves in the workplace and to feel that they're not cared for at work. In the US, there was a study that looked at the rates of employment for individuals with disability. Now, I haven't been able to find comparable statistics in Canada um, because there really is one survey that looks at disability statistics um, and it's released every five years and it was last released in 2017, but you can imagine based on the conditions of work that this would be quite similar in Canada. So the employment rate for individuals with disabilities actually increased in 2022 and surpassed the increase that we've seen in um, standard employment rates. Now this could be due to employment or labor shortage that created more opportunities for employees with disabilities, but it also created opportunities for those who maybe couldn't work before because now they have options for accommodations of remote working and flexibility, where in the past employers thought that that was unreasonable. And now employers are having everyone work from home. So the options for accommodations are increasing. So it's really important that when we look at our return to office plans and bringing employees back into the workplace, that we're not leaving behind the disability population, that we're having really good open communication about what these individuals need to continue to be supported. 
In December 2022, the government of Canada actually created the Disability Inclusion Business Council, which from a government and policy standpoint aims to champion and advance accessibility and inclusion in the workplace. So as an employer, how can you further support that? How can you continue to provide the support and accommodations that employees with disabilities need to be brought into the workforce, to be hired, to be retained, to be promoted, and to just focus on including those individuals as well? And if employees with disabilities continue to work remotely while the rest of the team returns to the office, thinking about how do you keep those employees included, connected, and feeling like they belong to the workplace, if that's a reasonable accommodation. Now, this is just a chart from the U.S. study by Kessler Foundation, uh, released actually January 2023, that looks at the changes in the labor force participation for people with disabilities and people without disabilities. So you'll see that in the U.S., at least, there's a historic high for employment and labor force participation for people with disabilities, which means we're on the right track. But we need to continue that. We need to continue providing accommodations and adjustments. We need to consider the impact of remote working, the opportunities that that provided, but also the challenges that that may create for some individuals. What is having flexibility provide for employees with disabilities and what are some accommodations that can help keep employees with disabilities in the workforce? We also saw a focus and conversation around individuals, um, neurodiverse individuals and employees. How do we support and include and provide accommodations for neurodiverse individuals? By creating awareness around this, by looking at the way we hire and retain employees, again, providing accommodations and continuing to have open communication with our employees with disabilities. And again, just the importance of thinking about your inclusion strategies. If it's determined that remote working is that best and reasonable accommodation, how do you continue to make sure that these employees are included in the workplace and that they can and that you can promote their career advancement? Now that we've reviewed some of the hot topics, I want to leave you with 10 strategies for your workplace when looking at your um, 2023 strategy to support uh, health and productivity for your workplace. Number one, again, probably comes at no surprise, but it is so important to develop a strong psychological health and safety program. We know that the return on investment is high for investing in workplace mental health programs and psychological health and safety programs. Um, Deloitte in 2018 said that the return on investment is $2.68 for every dollar spent in the first three years of implementing a psychological health and safety program. And based on what we've already talked about today, and based on burnout being so real, we know that that is true. We know that we need to support our employees' mental health. This study was from January 2022, and you've probably already seen these results. But at that time, um, we saw that burnout, one third of employees were uh, reporting workplace burnout. And we know that there was certain industries that had burnout rates above the national average. Um, so taking a look here, there's no surprise when we look at this list around the industries that are experiencing and continuing to experience higher proportions of burnout than the national average. What we know about burnout is that it is the body's response. It is our fight, flight, or freeze response that occurs during crisis, during periods of stress, during periods of uncertainty and lack of control. And when that happens over a long period of time, the resources in our body cannot keep up. So burnout arises when we don't have enough time for recovery between the repeated stressors that we experience. Now, looking at the world today, the changes of inflation and climate change and financial insecurity and wars around the world, you can imagine that workplace burnout is prevalent. And it's not just due to causes in the workplace, but there are causes of burnout within the workplace that can be controlled, including looking at workload, making sure that employees have the resources to manage the workload that they have, giving employees control over their decisions and their tasks, 
and the ways maybe that they do their work. Burnout can be caused by insufficient rewards. So taking a look at your top employees, are you providing the reward and recognition? Are you making sure that there's fairness in your organization, that there's a supportive community, and that um, there's the, a match between employees' values and their skills and the tasks that they're doing? You may notice, especially when employees start to feel burnt out, that they may have challenges with keeping up with workload, or they may experience difference changes in behavior or performance, but it's not by choice. Employees do not wake up and go to work and ask themselves, how can I mess up today? Employees are screaming for the things that they need to feel psychologically safe, to be able to share their ideas and opinions to have the right resources to do the work that they need, the tools, the time, the people, to feel safe, to have clear expectations around their workload, to feel competent, to have the development and the growth and the training, and to have fairness and a sense of belonging with their work workplace. And people come to work for certain reasons. And when we take a look at supporting their employees for what they need, that's when we're going to see those fundamental changes in the right direction. There are steps to psychological health and safety has to start with taking a look at your culture and involving your employees in that review, hearing the perspectives of your employees, because what we've often seen is that there is a mismatch between manager's perception or leader's perception of employee mental health and support and employees' perception of that. So are we listening to our employees? Are we asking for their input? And then are we taking action? When we think about psychological health and safety, it has to start from the top. We need support from the highest levels of leadership, and we need a cohesive response to psychological health and safety. We need to look at processes, workload, expectations, job descriptions, and tools we need to look at the boundaries that we allow employees to set and that we as leaders encourage employees to set and actually set ourselves. How do you as a leader also take care of yourself mentally, um, physically, and psychologically? Are we ensuring safety across the organization? And finally, what supports and resources are we providing to employees to make sure that they can access the care and support when they need it? At Gowan, we have many tools to assist with your psychological health and safety program, including our psychological health and safety consultation. We have a psychological safety in the workplace training, which includes a series of videos for employees and leaders to watch to learn about different areas of psychological safety. We are providing 25% off of that package and program until March 1st. So please contact us to learn more or go to our website to purchase that um, package on our training services. Looking at 2023, we know it's important to focus on the wellness within our workplaces, which really does start with psychological health and safety, but encompasses so much more in terms of supports and resources and coaching for your employees. So if you're starting to develop or looking at developing a workplace wellness program for your organization, please contact us. We'd love to consult on that. And we always are here for employee training as well. Step two, your second strategy for 2023 is to ensure that you have inclusive leaders. Now, leaders need training to be inclusive leaders. And in um, over 65% of managers indicate that they do not feel they have the skills or training to create an inclusive and supportive workplace. Now, you can imagine how this impacts employees. If the managers aren't feeling confident in their skills, how are we creating inclusive workspaces? Now, this was a review from 2021, but I looked at the list and I thought, you know what, it still applies. So we look at these top challenges that are facing managers continued uncertainty about the future, our well-being of employees, tracking team productivity, especially in our new hybrid workplaces. How do we shape and develop and promote a supportive and psychologically safe company culture? How do we recruit and onboard the right employees with the right skills? How do we onboard people virtually if people are working remotely? 
supporting diversity and inclusion in the workplace, managing communication and change management, looking at regulation and compliance with health and safety, with our laws and regulations, and technology and digitization. We can definitely see that that is going to increase exponentially um, over the next years. Looking at the skills gap, so looking at baby boomers potentially retiring and having younger professionals come into the workplace, how are we making sure that those young professionals have that those skills and that ability to continue with the uh, great services and skills that your organization has? We continue to see concerns with high staff turnover and employees are screaming for certain things in terms of flexibility, ability to work hybrid, um, benefits, mental health support, um, and without those, employees consider or do leave organizations. How do we create innovative teams? And the only way to create innovative teams is to have psychological health and safety, to have individuals that feel safe to share their ideas, to innovate, to be creative. Breaking down silos between teams, which became even harder when we started working virtually. How do we have that really good cross-communication and understanding of what's going on around the organization? Knowledge loss, people leaving the organization and not leaving their knowledge with them or having the, the skills transferred on to the rest of the organization. And then finally, finding that holy grail, team engagement, employee engagement. How do we keep people committed to, dedicated to, excited about, and in line with the values and the missions of our workplaces? There's an interesting study that was just released um, in 2023, so this month, that looked at the perception of workers and the impact of workplace on their mental health and stress. Now, this survey found that managers have just as much of an impact on an employee's mental health as their spouse, and even more of an impact than their doctor or their therapist. Now, as a leader, as a manager, you make an impact. And that impact can be very positive, but it also can be stressful. So looking at as a leader, do you have the skills and the training to be an inclusive, to be a supportive leader that has that positive impact on mental health? We also know from this study that 64% of respondents admit that they would take a pay cut for a job that better supports their mental wellness. What does that mean for you as a leader? How do you support employee health and productivity? The first step is to listen. We need to be heart-centered leaders. We need to care about our employees as humans and not as cogs in the machine. The way that we work and the focus on people is so huge now more than ever. So listening to employees with empathy, with attention, and with respect. And when we have employees who may have challenges or struggles, we need to listen for the reason and understand what the solutions are and work collaboratively. When we're managing employee productivity or performance, we need to make sure that employees have clear expectations of what their behaviors and their productivity and their performance needs to look like in order for them to be able to achieve. Giving them resources and support and then making sure that we have appropriate and consistent policies and procedures across the organization that um, allow for employees to have those clear expectations and that we also, we follow up and we follow through on the actions that we um, suggest we will take when we meet with our employees. Now, these skills don't always come naturally. We're not born knowing how to even communicate in an understanding and inclusive way. And so that's why we need training. This year, we're offering virtual inclusive manager training. We can offer this customized for your team. And we'll also be offering sessions in April and September in a public forum. Um, and those will be had, held virtually. So we're looking, um, if you're looking as a leader to understand what the inclusive practices are for individuals with disabilities and marginalized persons, understanding um, the why around inclus inclusivity for persons with disabilities. You'll learn about mental health, me mental well-being, 
how to have really challenging conversations, and how to provide practical tools, work adjustments, and supports for employees to stay at work, how to support your team relationships and focus on productivity, and you'll get tool toolkits with resources. Contact us to learn more, or we do have more information on our website. Step and strategy number three, as already mentioned, we need to provide resources because our employees are demanding flexibility, work-life balance, and mental health supports. They want an employee that focuses on wellness. We need to retain our valuable employees, and this means looking at ways of being flexible. So what are the options for flexibility within your workplace, especially as you return employees back to the workplace? Is there still flexibility allowed? Do they have the ability to adjust to planned workday if they need to attend to an urgent matter? Are they able to use personal time to um, include some of their work-life balance, to be a parent and go to a basketball game of their child one day? Can they flex their work time around their parental capabilities? Can they stagger their start times? How do we understand and acknowledge that employees have different work styles and needs? And how do we give them autonomy and make them feel that we or make them know that we trust them to do the work that they need to do? There was a study, again, this is a, an American study, but it looked at what workers are asking for. Um, it said that 71% of employees agree that their employer is concerned about their mental health more than they were in the past, which is a good sign. They know that employers are caring, but they need to see action. And 60 or a sorry, 81% say that mental health and well-being and supporting mental health is a factor in choosing the workplace that they will um, be employed with. Now, what are they asking for in terms of mental health supports, flexible work hours, a workplace culture that respects time off, the ability to work remotely, some are part of the time, and some are asking for a four-day work week, so considering what that might look like for your organization. And thinking about resilience, how do employees, how do we promote resilience in employees, how do we train employees to have resilience? Um, in all five of these muscle groups, physical, social, thinking, emotional, and spiritual. We did see in the Benefits Canada Healthcare Survey that there was increased mental health supports in 2022. The most common increased supports for mental health included employee training programs, increased counseling and mental health professional coverage in their benefits. They did see better leveraging and communication of the EAP programs an expanded list of healthcare providers to respect the needs of employees and support for employees. And they, we, they also found that virtual care for mental health was very well received by employees and their family members as that improved access to care. Continue thinking about the resources that you're providing to your employees, whether that be online resources, through your EAP, communicating what you have available in benefits and EAP, Providing employee training, mental health coaching sessions are a great way to show your employees that they have support to, um, to be well and stay well at the workplace. And we have many of those trainings um, materials for you and your team. A little bit more on our success coaching and our mental health coaching. Um, so success coaching is really a broad term for our occupational therapy services to support one-on-one -on -one employees. So what we're finding is many managers are finding that employees may be responding with different behaviors, communication styles, challenges in their social um, communication skills that may or may not be related to mental health concerns. Either way, success coaching is a great option for employees that can lead to retention of valuable staff, staff that may need to learn skills in one area to help them to be successful, to help them work well with their teams and to meet their goals. We provide these services virtually to employees um, and that we found with ease of access, being able to provide this time during work time can increase the ease of access for employees. It's proactive. When we did a program with a large technology um, uh, company, we found that all employees that participated in our program stayed at work. So reducing disability costs by providing this proactive coaching to employees. 
We help these employees develop skills in communication, emotion regulation, interpersonal skills, conflict resolution, and we can help with facilitating successful team interactions and working on how your team behaves and, and works together. We talked about one of the biggest challenges as employers, you may have heard of quiet quitting um, over the past year, but really that holy grail of employee satisfaction and productivity and well-being is engagement. What are your engagement strategies for 2023? How are you keeping connected with employees wherever they're working? Do you have scheduled regular check-ins with coworkers and managers? Do you allow employees to have think time or time where they can block in their calendar to really get into deep work on the projects they're doing? Uninterrupted time where they're free from distraction. What are you replacing for those water cooler discussions with the remote workers to keep them connected and engaged? How do you reduce isolation? So as we're returning employees to the office, are we being mindful about that? Do we have clear goals or tasks or collaboration projects that we have employees work on together? Getting off Zoom, we know that Zoom fatigue has had a big impact. So how do we allow people to get off Zoom, get back in person in a safe way so that we can collaborate? And it's important to ask your employees about their engagement and their satisfaction. Take pulse surveys. Anonymous surveys can be sent out to employees that can collect some really valuable feedback around the culture of your organization and how engaged and satisfied employees are. And the most important thing about those pulse surveys is to take action. So how are you showing employees that you're listening and you're taking actions on their concerns? Given the recent change in the employment insurance entitlement to 26 weeks, it is more important than ever to look at your disability management process. We know that after a six-month absence, there's only a 50% chance of a worker returning to the job. So that is making it even more important that we look at options for accommodating workers to stay at work as a first line or if they need to go off, if they're unsafe to be at work for recovery, how do we keep those employees connected to the workplace? And how do we support them to get back to work in a timely manner with the skills and abilities to be able to return and transition back into the workplace? At Gowan, we provide occupational therapy support for just that, whether that be for determining and implementing appropriate accommodations or looking at helping employees to reactivate and return to work. So employees who have been off work for a period of time, our occupational therapists have been engaging these employees in behavioral activation, building the skills, the routine, and providing psychotherapy and coping skills to help these employees return and transition back into the workplace. And importantly, if you have employees returning back to the workplace, having a really good return to work facilitation meeting between the manager, employee, and an occupational therapist can really help with that communication, that trust, and can help managers to be implementing accommodation supports so that we can keep employees at work after they've returned. Your seventh strategy for workplace health and productivity this year is to ensure that you have ergonomic workstations so that employees have healthy physical habits in place as well. So as we look at remote and hybrid working, are you providing training for your employees to understand the risk factors for repetitive strain injuries and what may be present in their workplaces? What support do you provide for employees to be able to set up their workstation so that they're safe and healthy while they're working? Ergonomic solutions at Gowan include Ergo Blast. So if you're looking to have an occupational therapist come on site, provide that education to your employees and do quick workstation adjustments for all of your employees. We do have Ergo Blast options. We have group ergonomic training in person and virtually because we know that employers have an obligation to ensure that employees are aware of their injury work uh, risk factors, not just in the work Place, the physical office workplace, but also the home workstation.
We also provide one-to-one -one ergonomic assessment and intervention for those that need additional support or may have medical conditions to take into consideration when determining the best ergonomics. So please reach out to us to learn more or to make a referral for an ergonomic assessment or training. And as always, we want to continue to provide accommodations to employees. We want to make sure that those accommodations are reasonable. And sometimes the accommodations that employees require are not obvious. They may be complex with neurodiverse individuals, with chronic conditions, with long COVID, as an employer, it's hard for you to, to determine what an employee really needs to be successful. So that's why we recommend you have an occupational therapy accommodation assessment that allows us to take a look from an objective standpoint at what an employee needs to be supported in the workplace and make those recommendations back to your workplace to help you meet your legal obligation for that duty to accommodate. Some of those hot topics that you may begin to see more of over this 2023 year is the return to office accommodation request. So employees requesting to continue working from home as you have return to office um, mandates in place. Long COVID and cognitive accommodations. So the importance of having functional cognitive assessments for employees who may be experiencing those challenges with problem solving or with memory or with fatigue and energy that impacts their cognition. Looking at accommodations for neurodiverse individuals. How do we support and um, provide accommodations to this population? Definitely um, a great area to have support from an occupational therapist. Given the, um, the delays in healthcare, how do we provide temporary accommodations? And what are the resources that we're giving employees to help them stay at work with these delays? And what impact will technology have on the solutions we have for accommodations? As occupational therapists, we are continually looking at best practices and release of new technologies to ensure that employees can be supported in the best ways in their workplaces. And with the digitization of our world, I can only expect that this will increase over the next couple of years, the options for accessibility and accommodation in the workplace. So contact us for an accommodation assessment or even just to consult on one of your challenging files. And we will do an assessment as an occupational therapist. We'll interview the manager, the employee, we'll look at the work demands and the employee's functional abilities to determine what strategies and skills or tools will be helpful for that employee to be successful and be productive in their roles. As always, an occupational therapist is that regulated health professional. We understand the health condition, we understand the workplace demands and the context of the work environment, including the culture, the manager interactions, the physical environment, so that we can really take a holistic view when we make those suggestions for workplace accommodation. Of course, you guessed it, number nine is make a referral. Engage our occupational therapists with expertise in workplace health and safety to assist your employees with accommodations, stay at work planning, ergonomics, virtual and in-person, mental health support and training, psychological health and safety consultation um, to help support your workplaces. Finally, as promised a little bit more about our membership, um, get in while the doors are open. We are opening that again, March 1st, 2023. And um, it'll be 25% off if you join during the month of March. We have different options available for different size employers um, and, and organizations. But what you'll get with that membership is so invaluable. You get a monthly webinar every month about a new topic about health and disability management. When you join the membership in the month of March, you're going to get access to our Return to Work Essentials course. You get employee tools every month. You get a video or a handout for your employees to focus on health and productivity. You get a consultation with one of our clinical lead occupational therapists every month to discuss your um, strategies or a specific case um, in workplace accommodation. You'll get 25% off all of our workshops and our certificate programs. And there's always bonus activities and connection and collaboration with other individuals within the disability and human resources space. So again, find out more at our um, 
our website. Our February topic for membership is really in line with what we talked about today, looking at mild cognitive impairment and how cognitive um, issues can show up in the workplace and what are some accommodation strategies for that. If you'd like access to that, that um, webinar, please let us know. If you'd like to kind of see what's involved in the membership and join in on that, reach out to us to discuss um, joining in on that membership webinar this month. And as always, get social with us. So we are all, or we are on all of the platforms. Um, we are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, connect with us. We share lots of great tips, resources. We have our newsletter and our weekly blog, our Tuesday tips. Um, and you can um, follow us at any time. So please feel free to connect with us. Check out our website. We did launch a new website in September this year that we worked really hard on. Um, so I'd love for you to all see that and any feedback you have about our new website um, would love to see. Connect with me personally on LinkedIn and also always follow our account on LinkedIn. I didn't leave a lot of time, but um, I'm going to take a look at the questions in the chat right now. If anyone has to hop off, please feel free. I'll get through as many as I can um, and then follow up with those who I don't get to. So thank you so much for spending the last hour with me. Again, if you want more information, here's our contact information. I'll leave that up as I uh, look through the chat here. I had a question about, and I think this is talking about accommodation and hybrid work, talked about work-life balance, family needs, being a primary caregiver for older parents and family member. Absolutely, these have all been um, topics of the last year. So we do have employees demanding that work-life balance. So looking for that flexibility, you talked a bit about the options for flexibility family needs. So what, what do you allow your employees in terms of that flexibility to be uh, a caretaker or a caregiver, um, to be a family member, to be a parent? Um, you do have control as the employer organization to look at how you provide that flexibility to your employees. John says employers are not responsible for access to medical care, which we do um, agree that you're not responsible for that. However, it may impact the recovery of your employees in getting the proper care. It may impact your ability to get medical documentation and notes. So what we want to look at is how do we support employees to stay at work? How do we give other supports or resources to employees that may be available through the organization? I had some um, comments here about sharing the presentation and we can share the presentation slides with you. So after today, um, we'll make sure that you get the link for this recording as well as the, the slides for the presentation today. Looks like that was all we have in the chat. So I just wanna say again, thank you so much um, for being here for my first annual review webinar. And I really look forward to connecting with more of you and all of you throughout the next year um, and more to come. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day.